How was the party last night? Was great. you good? There was someone there like, oh, it was a great party. I had this voice. So my name is uh, David Gonzalez. I'm an Android developer. Um, I'm currently working for a company called Mixed Styles. And um, I wanted to talk to you today about multi-platform library. And Aliel explained that we did trying to uh, jump into that wagon of you know shared logic and shared code and be able to basically because we're lazy, want to work less and get more things done and be able to actually focus on on what's important, which is the the delivery of the product and all the uh, and all the features. So we started talking about multi-platform and as an experiment to see what could be done and if there's something that we could do to make development. Uh, faster and also to be able to just have more confidence in what we're actually building uh, and also just to play for fun with multi-platform and see, and see what it is. Does anyone try multi-platform libraries or multi-platform? Three hands, you don't count. Three, four, okay. Um, basically, why, why is this important, right? And when, when we talk about multi-platform or we talk about shared code or shared business logic, he always had this face like, well, we have so many different frameworks or libraries that have promised that they will do exactly this. So you have Titanium, Xamarin, PhoneGap, Accelerator, Ionic, React Native. All these are valid solutions for specific edge cases or specific cases, but they don't, they, they lack the part where you have the best of both worlds. You have the best of working with UI in native, as in iOS or in Android, and also allowing you to have this shared logic somewhere, right? And that's what Kotlin Multiplatform tries to, tries to solve. And I think what's important to, to note is that the, the actual multi-platform work means that you have some piece of code that is gonna be living in a module that can be tested, that can be used by everybody, but the UI side of things, it's still gonna be UI that can implement on your uh, language that you're more, more comfortable with, say Swift or Kotlin or Java or JFTC. Basically the plan is you want to achieve a moment where you can excel at what you actually know versus, you know, basically in, in previous times with all these different frameworks, you always have the idea of, well, if it's front-end, just write it in JavaScript and everyone is happy, right? Why do we need to have native developers if we can just have, you know, web developers that can do all the work for us? And the idea here is not just to part one of the framework, not just to you make the Android team happy or not just make the iOS team happy, but make both teams that are happier and more productive. Um, the truth is, everything that we're going to see here since one calling 1 1.2, 1.3, everything is up for, for change and up for debate. It's still experimental feature, which means that it's fun to play with, but also means that you're gonna have a lot of issues that you're not really gonna understand what to, what to do with them. And you end up having this phase of frustration because you're trying to make just a simple sample work and you spend half an hour, and I've spent half an hour and two hours trying to make something compile, and I didn't know why it isn't compile. And then, luckily, in the Kotlin Slack, there's a lot of help from people who've been fighting against this all the time, and they, they have to help. But it, it is not a simple journey. It's not as, as simple as just you know, getting some skeleton code and make, it, and make it work. Obviously, the model has limitations, and, and it's important to understand that what we actually want to achieve is a way where we are confident that we can have we can move forward with our products and things that we can also add to our existing code base. Because many issues we had for, for example, say you want to add now, uh, you wanted to move to React Native, it's not as simple as, oh, I'm gonna have this little single view in my you know, Android Kotlin project and it's gonna work. It's not as simple as that. And, and this is what I'm trying to, to achieve with, with multi-platform. In, in how, how does this work, really? There's, there's a, a mechanism called the expect and the actual. So basically what we want to say is that every component can share uh, as much code as needed with others, but what we want to do is the, act, the expected, say a function or a variable is going to be living in this shared code, but then the actual implementation of those uh, functions or variables can be completely tailored to iOS or Android or the different platforms that you can, that you can target. So let's see how this works. 
we have a function called write log message, and this expect fun means expect means is the, the, the keyword that we use to say this is what we want to use in our common code. Uh, in this case, we're going to try to pretend to write a log message, right? And what we want to do here is this, this log debug, log one, and log error, this expected API can be using this common code. We can just call this, and the compiler doesn't need to know what is the actual implementation of this function, right? It expects that the targets, the different multi-platforms that we're going to, to target, are going to be the ones providing the actual implementation. So how does that mean? We have this, say this is JVM, this write log message, the actual implementation of the function is going to be, which is going to print a single message, a simple message to the, in the, in the, just trying to write the log as expect, uh, expected output. But if we also are targeting JavaScript, you could have a console that is just logging the message. And you see that the, the signature of the function is exactly the same for any of the platforms that you're targeting, but implementation is different. And that's very helpful in the sense of, well, when we work, we work with the common code. We don't really care how is it implemented in different platforms. And then each of those platforms will take care of the implementation. And that's the, the powerful tool that we have here. The ID also helps you a lot. So for example, if you declare this in, in your common code, say, well, we have this platform title and I'm expecting it, the compiler knows, based on your configuration of the project, it does know that there are some, you know, there's two platforms, Android and iOS, that don't have an, an actual declaration of this, of this function. And then it's a very, they have very quickly easy fix that will allow you to do this. You can just create a function using the ID, and it will just generate those functions for you. So at least at that point, the ID is, is smart enough to know that there are functions that need to be implemented, and it will help you to, to it will tell you, hey, this still is missing, please, please take care of it. <coughs> but there's, there's one question that we need to address a little bit, which is calling native versus calling multi-platform. And it, it all comes down to the plugins that you're actually using, right? When you would start a multi-platform project, you're using, you're applying the calling multi-platform project, uh, plugin. What does that mean? Native, the native plugin is only for native projects. It means you're not targeting any platform. You're just working with native, with native code. But if you want to target different platforms, then you need to use the Kali multi-platform plugin. Um, it's a very, it's a completely different approach, and it is really, something that's really hard to understand when some of the people talk about calling native or calling multi-platform, it's, it's important to know the distinction between both, because uh, I always get confused, and it's not, it's not a simple, it's not a trivial, a trivial differentiation. <coughs> Let's see, there's something called the platform specific declarations. Um, basically what this means is you can have a platform specific library that you want to use in your common code, but uh, you want to be providing this, your own implementation for, for another platform. So what it allows you to do is providing a type alias. So let's say in your common code you have an atomic reference class that you've defined. And you can say, well, if I'm targeting JVM, I want to make sure that when I call this class, you declare a type alias and actually using this Java concurring atomic reference class. So you can also play with things like this. You can say, well, I'm creating a class that lives in the common code, but the actual implementation of that class, I want it to be using a specific library that is only, in this case, targeted for the JVM. And then if you were to target another, <coughs> another platform, then you will have to provide a different implementation. Um, but let's see, it's, it's, not a simple, it's not a simple solution, so let's try to get started to build something uh, and, see, and see what, the, what the ID is telling us to do and what is the help that we, that we would get. So if you start with IntelliJ, you have different options when you start a new project, and you have four, in this case, with multi-platform. Right? We have JS Client, multi-platform library, Android iOS, and the mobile share library. Don't really know, so what am what we trying to achieve? Are we building a multi-platform library? Are we building a mobile iOS or mobile share library? It's really hard to to decide. So I say, well, let's choose multi-platform library, thinking this is the way to go. But when we do this, this is what the ID will generate. You have an Android folder, which is what will be the Android project, but then it creates a, share, a source folder on the same root folder. And that is where the multi-platform common code will live. 
which means that after half an hour trying to understand why you get this Gradle file, I don't know what's going on. There's some failure in some plugin, and if you look into the different build of Gradle files, they all happen to be, the references are complete messed up, and you don't really understand what's going on. So just as a starter, if you want to build something, it's really putting you off, right? Because it's not, well, it's not as simple as I thought it was going to be. But let's see, let's try to do it together and see if we get to a point. We have, we're gonna define the root folder. This is what our project is going to be. And this root folder has three subfolders. The Android app, which is going to be what you are used to as an Android developer. This is a common Android code. It is a call, this, sorry, it's an Android uh, application. Then we have the iOS app, which is gonna be what an iOS developer will tell you. This is a normal structure of an iOS project. You have your Xcode files, your Xcode projects, and everything that an iOS app needs to run. And then we have a, diff a new folder, which is the shared code. That's the name of your library, that's the name of what you want to build, and it has a subset of folders that we're gonna get into it now. So these folders are, imagine we're talking about having a library for iOS and Android, so we're gonna define three different folders, the Android main, common main, and iOS main. What, what does this mean? Common main is what we discuss, is the, the place where we will set all those expect functions or expect variables. This is the common code that will be used for all the different platforms. Android main and iOS main is where we will define the actual implementation of those functions. So what happens when we target, when we build, let's say, when I generate an output and a binary, which is the artifact of, what we, of this library, if we target the Android platform, everything which is inside the Android main is gonna be part of your AAR. And everything which is inside the iOS main folder is what will be packaged in the framework file that will be used later in the iOS library. So how do we, how do we go about that? In, it's still this folder, this root folder that we defined before, it still has a build.gradle file, and that's the interesting this kind, this time, the distinction with other frameworks. This is still a Gradle file, a Gradle project, and allows you to use everything that you've known so far about Gradle, uh, you can have it in Groovy, you can write it in Kotlin. That's still the same thing for us as, I, as Android developers. We still know what we're talking about here. What we can do now is gonna create different source sets, and we're saying, well, all the dependencies that I want you to use in this common main can be defined like this. And this is the, the dependencies that the common codes in the common main folder will have. You can also declare the dependencies for the common test, but what gets interesting is, for the Android main folder, I want you to use specific Android implementations for here, for example, we're talking about the coroutines on Android. That's the part that we already know. That is the same thing as we've always had as in, in an Android application. And even the same thing for the Android test. And also, if we have the iOS folder, we also have specific implementations for the iOS, uh, for an iOS application. So by, by defining this in this sense, we know we can tell exactly to all the different modules and different folders how we're gonna get uh, take care of, of different dependencies. Let's see how we define this Gradle file. Let's see how we can make it work on, for example, Android Studio. And Android is very simple. You just have to import the library of the module the same way you would do with any other local module in your project. Uh, this also works the same way if you were to publish that Android main, that library as an AAR, in Cartage or any, like in any distribution uh, system, you can just add it the same way you would done it before. It doesn't matter for your Android, it doesn't matter if it's a multi-platform library or not, you're still seeing an AAR or a JAR, so it's, for you it's exactly the same. The problem starts here with, with iOS. Um, it's not as simple as it is, and for my iOS colleagues where they have to start implementing this and making it using their own project, um, it's a bit, yeah, it's a bit, if the experience is not as good as it was. So let's see. What we have to do is in our in the build gradle file for, for your common, for your, your share library, you can define different targets. And this is where we're saying I want to use Android and I want to also target iOS. And what we're trying to do is we have this framework that we have here. This is basically telling you I want you when you're creating this library for iOS, I need you to create a framework file. And this is for any iOS developer, is exactly what they expect to use as a different, uh, as a dependency. What we call AERs in Android, for them it's a framework file. And this is how Gradle goes about that. 
Now, things get boring when you have like a massive stream of code like this, when all this is trying to do is generate an output file for, for iOS. Uh, and this is what we need to define in our Gradle file, uh, just to tell when you are actually building your project, I need to generate a framework file every single time. Uh, it gets quite boring, but what happens here? Ah, yes. Once you've done this, you need to go to your Xcode and start doing a few configurations on your, on your settings, which gets boring and boring, and more things you have to do, and more things. So if you, at that point, if you're the iOS engineer, like, I really don't want to go through all this hassle. This is just for one library. What if we develop seven or eight? I have to do different things like this. And does this work for everyone on my team? Does it only work for one? Do I have to do it every single time? So it's not, it's not as simple as, as, we, as we see. Likely, uh, Alex Trump from Square has built a plugin that allows you to do all this dance that you've seen before with screenshots and configuration folders. It's a plugin that allows you to do all them by themselves, um, which is already a step forward. And I think that's the, the direction that uh, looks like multi platform is trying to take. It's about let's make things easy for everybody, not just for the Android team, right? Because in the end, you're never going to convince all your iOS peers to start using a calling library, you even get interested about it, if they have to go through a hassle of 50 minutes of configuration and syncing and building until maybe the whole thing works. The point is, it needs to be seamless for, for everybody. And I know that there are people working on it, and I think it will, we will get there, uh, but it's still a bit early stages. Let's see. When the, the question when you want to decide, well, let's start to build something like this, is deciding, okay, what do we want to share? Do we want to share just variables and functions? Do we want to share uh, networking codes? Do we want to share the database? Do we want to share, imagine we're using a model view presenter approach. Do we want to share presenters with all the different platforms that we're trying to use? And to me, the answer is just keep it simple. Does anyone know this group? Because I, just, I love the hair of the guy in the middle, it's quite impressive. Basically, the point is, just keep it simple. Whatever works for you, it is always a good, a good answer. And in our case, it's what we try to do is something simple. And um, it doesn't mean that you have to start all the way sharing your presentation logic or sharing the most difficult part of your code. Let's start with something very simple. So here comes a lame example, so you know what, you're talk what, what I'm talking about. Let's say you have <coughs> this library, and we're going to define one function called platform name. We want that this function, when we call it from uh, this, when we call platform name from different uh, from iOS and Android, we expect different values. So how do we go? We say in the Android main, we're going to have the actual implementation of that string is going to be Android shared photos. And the same function, when we do it from iOS, what we're going to expect is iOS share photos. It is um, a very simple example to just to sh so you see how, how it would actually work on, 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 a real, on a real application. How do we do this from the Android side? On Android, we just have to import the actual name of the library. And you need to prob sometimes you just need to type it all yourself. Like the IDE won't always complete the actual uh, import of the, of the whole package name. And we just call the function. That's what it is. For you, it's a simple calling function. That's all you have to do. On the iOS side, though, <coughs> it appears this platform on KT. Uh, this KT is a suffix that gets added when this framework is compiled. And what it does is if my function platform name lives in a platform.kt file, whatever file you want to put, whatever name it is, it will always add its suffix. So on, from iOS, you have to import shared. What you see here is shared. That is the name of your module, the name of your multi-platform library. You have to import it, and then Xcode will know, all right, this is a new, fra a new framework that I can import, that I get to use. And then it will ask you to bring this platform.kt. Um, if the file where you've defined these functions is called uh, strings iOS, then your code here will be a strings iOS dot uh, kt. Basically, this suffix is always added to the end of your of your file, and that's the way that iOS knows that this is a function inside this uh, this uh, this file that they can use from calling. This is how you would call calling code from uh, from Swift. 
And in the end, you get a marvelous example of two beautiful applications with iOS shared and I told you it was a lame example, right? So that was the whole point of this is how easy it can be. But obviously, yeah, you want something a bit more complicated, right? Adding just uh, strings and functions like this is not, is not good enough. Now is when it gets interesting, because for, for things to move uh, in the right direction, that for things to be available in all the different platforms, there's a bunch of libraries we're going to have to start adding uh, that are not common to what we've done so far. Uh, so let's take a look. There's the first one is this uh, serialization project. This is a uh, multi-platform, multi-format serialization library, and what it actually does is creates uh, visitor code for your classes. So what we try to do is, is serialization and deserialization of objects without using reflection. Why is this important? Because passing values from your library, your multi-platform library, to iOS or to Android is not as trivial as we would think. Uh, so there's a lot of things that get involved, especially on the iOS side, that is not, uh, it's just not trivial to make sure that the values or the variables that we expect to exist in Kotlin, they are not always the same values that you would get on the iOS side on Objective-C. So this plugin tries to help with this, especially in conjunction with Ktor. So Ktor is a, um, is a networking library, but we would use, normally use Retrofit, but there's no such thing as Retrofit for iOS. So uh, what Jevons did, they built uh, this Ktor framework that allows you to have backend and client codes using always the same, all the same library. And it's quite interesting because being multi-platform from the beginning, it means that on your Android and your iOS code, you can both use Ktor and its clients, uh, and therefore the language you're actually speaking between different teams is the same. And then there's the next part where things are more interesting is in terms of threading. So <coughs> There's no equivalent of, you know, iOS would have the queue dispatcher that iOS would use. In Java calling you will have your threads. So it's just different ways to do threading and asynchronous programming in both platforms. But luckily we have coroutines. And there's a way that you can have uh, your coroutines dispatcher used on your multi-platform library. And then both iOS and Android are completely agnostic to its implementation. So on the Android side, you will be using dispatches.main, but unfortunately this is not available for iOS. So on iOS, the actual implementation of this coroutine will have to go in a different direction. And what it works so far is using the NSQ dispatcher. This is like the default way of iOS to treat, uh, let's say, let's call it threads to make it very simple. And basically what we're saying here is, anytime that I'm using application dispatcher in my shared multi-platform code, when this is called from an iOS uh, and suite on Objective-C, what we're actually going to do is run this queue that is what the iOS framework knows. Funny enough, when you call, you can grade all this code and you still have the auto-completion of the IDE if you're interested to, and this is still ca uh, calling code, but you're actually using UI, sorry, you're still using iOS frameworks under the hood. So you're still using Swift or language that your iOS developers will understand on, on the Kotlin side. Um, so as a kind of a bit more complicated example, let's try to build something like this. We're going to try to share. Uh, it's a networking code. It fetches Instagram photos of my dog and my wife sleeping and a few things. We're going to build all these codes in the multi-platform library. And then we're going to call this from iOS and Android. And let's see how, how it looks. So we're going to define a repository. This is also always in the, in the multi-platform library part. And what we define is this HTTP client, which is how Ktor uh, instantiates its, its own code. And we're saying um, you can define mappers for the responses that you would get from those codes. The uh, serializer that you see here, here, that is the part of the calling serialization plugin that we saw earlier. Essentially, what we're trying to do here is whenever we make a call, we can have a Instagram response. Then I know I want to deserialize it as a string, so both platforms can can understand what it is. And we're just going to define a very simple API call. It's a get call to this URL, and we're going to get the most recent photos from Instagram. Interesting here is you have the suspending function. This is an actual suspending function that needs to be called from a coroutine, right? 
And also note that there's a token string that needs to be passed in from whoever is going to call is going to call this guy. So what's happening? Always in the common codes, you're going to load all these photos in a synchronous manner, and uh, we're defining, you know, like a normal coroutine code you would, that you would write. You're launching a coroutine. You're asking what is the dispatcher you want it to be launched. You're making the call, and then using the callback to just return the data, the, the results from this from this call. That's all it takes to launch a synchronous code. And when this is called both from iOS or Android, there's nothing else you have to do. This is the same code for both platforms. And I think that is the, in, in, when we're doing the experiment, that is the interesting part. Because this is the same, you know, a very simple networking library you can have for, for both platforms and there's not much to it, right? Let's see. If you're on your Android code, you have this, uh, you can instantiate this repository. Uh, interesting to note here is if we look at the repository here, by default, we have this API class, which is the actual API endpoint that we will be calling. On the Android side, you can simply you know, instantiate the class and use it. And it looks like any other calling code you would write, right? From the iOS side, however, we still have to import the module that we did so far. But we do need to provide this default implementation and on calling will work. We still need to get this API class that we're going to have to pass in the repository. This is one of the first, you know, difference between uh, differences between iOS and Android for this specific, for this specific example. Then, the other thing is you have this, um, as we see here, whenever you're calling uh, calling codes from Swift, um, if a function that you have returns a unit, which is the default return for a function, you need to tell from Swift, I want you to return a calling unit. This is not really very, it's not quite nice when you have to write this, right? So there's ways that you can make it simpler. So it's why we have this uh, close, this type alias, we're trying to, to make it to wrap the result and the lambda we're going to call, pass it here in the request, and then when we actually call the code from the view controller, which is the, the equivalent of the activity on iOS, we can call it like this. It's not as pretty as just call it from, the, from Android, but it's still good enough uh, for, for, for things to work out. And then it's the same thing. It's very simple. You call the same function, and you get the result, and then you just show it. And in the end, you get, again, the same thing. So. There's things that you can do that make it quite simple, uh, but it's still it's not perfect. From the experience from an iOS set is not is still not perfect, right? Uh, so these are things that we will need to that it will need to be worked on for for a better adoption, I think. What else can we do? Let's see, if we can have shared databases. Um, let's see if there's something we can work and, and and make this happen. I think we're all familiar with SQL delights, and now you can use SQL delight also on iOS. What does that mean? You can have this expect same mechanism as before. You can have the shared database object that allows you to then make queries to uh, this local database. And what we have is um, both implementations for iOS and Android. When you actually pass in the driver, you can say, well, when I'm on iOS, I want you to use the native SQL driver. But when I am on Android, I want you to use the default Android SQL driver. Um, again, when you're calling things, you're still calling the common codes, but you have both platforms have their own implementation and allows you to make specific changes for, for both of them. What does that mean? You could have something like this. Imagine that you have to pass in this token that we had before, that you have to pass in your API call. You could store it and doing the shared DB object that is the actual uh, the DB implementation, you can still get that token, this executors one that you see at the end, is a, diff is, um, is a um, naming convention from uh, SQL Delight. You can either return one value, return a list of values. Uh, but don't worry, this is all an example that you will see. It's all uploaded to GitHub. You can play with, with that later. But essentially, this is, again, common codes. And this, when this is called from both platforms, is completely agnostic to the iOS or the Android platform. And it will still work the same way. Um, using their proper drivers for, for each of the calls. Let's see something else that you can also do. If you really want to get into more sharing and having more business logic shared between all the different platforms, you can even try to share presentation logic. So let's see how it looks. In the, um, 
This is a base presenter. This is from the Kolenkampf app. It's a very good example of how things can be done on a multi profile level. And basically, it's just a presenter that allows you to call uh, coroutines and has uh, a yes capable tool to launch coroutines from from that presenter. There's no need to get into much of the implementation detail now. The idea is you have a common presenter that will be using your that will be defining your library, and that will be like a normal presenter that you're used to. You have a view that will be an interface, and that interface will be implemented by those platforms, and then you can call loading, you can call the repository that we defined before, and you can just return that data. So in your shared code library, you would have this uh, photos view, which is the actual the interface. And then on Android, you would have your activity implementing that view. And on iOS, you would have your view controller uh, implemented that view, that, sorry, that interface. The interface is something defined like this. Um, and then when we want to make these calls from both platforms, then on Android, you would have you know, a set visibility visible in one of your spinners. And when you, this is called on iOS, then you just call your load spinner, you start animating it. Interesting is that the, the part that is shared, this namings and the name of the functions is the same for both platforms. But again, here we're using the best of the UI native code on iOS to, in this case, simple example of a spinner, but uh, you get the point. The idea is that the UI layer will be always rendered using Swift or Objective-C, but the logic of when this view is loading, when the data is being loaded, it's still something shared that you only have to write once, and then both UI layers need to be implemented in the proper way. Let's talk about testing. Uh, it's not as simple as, uh, as you would like, but let's get. Anything which is tested, uh, any synchronous code, you only have to test it from the common code from your from your library. You can define all those tests in your library and run them. Uh, so you don't have to run them both on iOS and Android, just running them from the common library works. The problem is, if you start adding coroutines in that library, uh, the common test is no longer going to work. Because it's going to try to use the different platforms to run them, and it's, that's not going to be possible. The reason is that run blocking, which is what you would call when you're writing a proper test for a coroutine, that doesn't exist in all platforms. Especially JavaScript doesn't have an implementation for this. So you need to find a way to go around it. Um, so I was in Drake on Italy a few weeks back, and Ellen Shapiro had a very cool idea how to do this. Uh, so this is from her project, the Porch Spider Protector, which is a very nice example of multi-platform code. Um, and basically, you just lying to the system saying, well, I want to have my own platform run blocking, which is on, you define on your common test, and then on the Android, the Android and the iOS uh, test folders, you will find the suspending function that is actually going to call run blocking. If you do something like this, then your presenter test, the presenter we saw earlier, we have this platform run blocking, and then you will just write a simple test that you would write it before, right? You have your view, you have your presenter, and then you call it, and you assert that you know the view, the show loading function was was called. And oh, this is double. So the nice thing is when you run Android main as, and you run all the tests from the Android folder, they will also run all the tests inside the common test folder. Uh, so it's not the best outcome, but at least you know that you can test all your coroutine, all the asynchronous code in coroutines that exist in your common library. You can always run it from the Android side. So if you were to run tests on Android Studio from, for, for this library, all those codes will be done. And then you can have this nice report of the unit with all the different, you know, and a proper HTML report with all your tests, and you see if which one failed or which one didn't. Um, again, this is only working right now for, for iOS. You cannot do it from the Android, uh, sorry, for Android, you cannot do it from iOS. Um, so it's something that should be fixed at some point, but at least you know that these things work. And let's see, in terms of conclusions, I think that we, that we saw, there's one of the biggest issues that you have so far is that for now, you can't debug calling code when you run it from Xcode. So I think yesterday night, Kevin Galligan from TouchLab in New York kind of dropped that he had a plugin that he will be publishing today about you know, making able to debug calling from Xcode. So once that's done, um, again, as a better, you know, and trying to gap um, 
close the gap between iOS and Android in terms of experience for developer experience for, for all this multi-platform stuff. Also, um, using immutable objects over immutable objects should be preferred. This is also, of course, not just for multi-platform, but the point is if you have, via, you have objects that are defined in your platforms, but are, mute, are mutated from the shared library, it's not gonna work. There is, however, a library from TouchLab as well that allows you to change the state of mutable ob the state of objects on, on a multi-platform library. I haven't used it so far, but it's in the references that you can take a look. It would allow you to do these changes. Third, and I think more important for us, was the, the actual classes that you would see on iOS and Android in terms of calling um, and the, so the classes that you would define in your library, for example, an array in Kotlin is not an array in Swift. It's not the equivalent of it. Or if you have an enum in Kotlin and you want to use that enum from Swift, you still need to have um, one default case for that enum. So it doesn't work the same way. The, the, the actual structure of those classes are not the same. Uh, so this thing that you have to, to work around. And then most importantly, you have to just keep everyone engaged. You can't just come in to your team and say, hey guys, we're gonna start using multi-platform libraries all the time, because the iOS team, if you just try to impose something on them, it's not, they're not gonna be as happy as, as, as you are, because for an Android, from the Android perspective, it's very simple to adopt all this, but from the iOS side, it's not as easy. So also yesterday, I think Toslab and Square are working together now to making the experience of iOS um, easier on, on, on a good multi-platform library. Uh, so there's a post that they put yesterday and they're working together, so I think that's a good shout out and um, hopefully their collaboration will make things easier for the rest of us. And, um, and that's important to, to know that it's just people working on it and probably will be better as of the time comes. And then some references, we have the calling conf app, which is a very good example of uh, multi-platform for web, iOS, and Android. The uh, library from, so the, code, the project from Ellen Shapiro about the pirate protector, that has even a backend server in the same project, so you call to your backend as well, and it has the backend codes also in that library. And then everything you've seen from the repositories and the cloud photos is also updated if you wanna take a look. Um, and there's a few talks that you, if you're interested, it would be good to, to watch. Everything from Kevin Gallagher at Toastlab is very interesting. Then there's a webinar as well that the guys from JetBrains opened and they were discussing structure of multi-platform projects and calling native projects. Uh, and then also there's a nice talk about Ryan, from Ryan Harder about calling, uh, KTOR. Um, and that's all I have. For me, it's been, the experience has been great in terms of knowing how to use multi-platform, how easy it would be. Uh, I think from the iOS side, it's not as convenient as, as for, for an Android side. But I think we'll get there. It's a nice way to start adding things. In, in our case, we're gonna start building the networking code for our backend in a multi-platform library, and then just having to write those endpoints once as opposed to run them twice. Uh, I don't think we'll get to the point to actually share presentation logic and also share the database. But at least step by step, that would be a good, a good start. So that's all I have. Thanks for listening. I think we have some time for questions. Yeah. If I didn't get to board, up there. Thank you. Uh, simple but interesting question. So these uh, common tests, they run on GVM? They can, yes. No, but uh, when you run, you say, if, oh, so if you say, if you run Android tests and you they run common, they run on GVM. If you run iOS tests and you run common, then they run on the yes. on the native platform. So as long as they are synchronous code, there's nothing like coroutines in, the, in, in that folder, you're able to run it from iOS as well. In the end, you still need to use a Gradle command to run them. So basically what you would have is your suite of tests on Xcode and then you would, hack, you would hook in a new debug, like a new script at the end of those steps to run all the tests on the, on the, on the common module. 
you have your CI, basically your CI could be the one running those, right? You don't need to run them from the IDE, you can have your CI running them. But this means I should run them twice because it's two different implementations, basically. So no, the, if it's in common, it's one implementation for both. No, but we'll gen if I understand correctly, it's one implementation, but it will generate two different binaries, so you still probably want to run two different binaries. I see what you mean. I think from what I've seen, the common test, you only want to run in one place, so as opposed to, let's see, I'm really not, I'm not sure if you will have to run them twice. I know if you were to run them from the Android side, they will run automatically when you run Android main, but I don't think that it will run from the iOS side. Okay, we can take, it's a good, it's a good point, I'm going to see. Thank you for your talk. Uh, so if I understand correctly, uh, when we are in the Android main um, part of the Kotlin multi-platform library, uh, we can use Android libraries and uh, the Android framework, but uh, when we are on the iOS main side, we cannot use iOS library, right? Yes, you could, yeah. Okay. How, uh, because, uh, so but what you cannot do is you cannot import you know, the pods that you would normally import from Xcode. You won't have them reading in that part. But what you could do is having that code that then will be called from the Xcode part from the iOS project. You could just have interfaces or the expect functions to be in that common library and then the actual implementation on the Xcode side. Well, we can't reference pods, for instance. Yeah, no. Okay, thank you. That's still a graded file, yeah. Hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. Okay. Uh, you, you talked about um, uh, using Kator and uh, coroutines, uh, so you can uh, uh, do a API uh, call uh, as asynchronously, uh, but I guess uh, the call is uh, is made in uh, the still made in the main thread. Depends how you implement it. <coughs> so by, by default it will. But if you want to use, as you saw this example with the coroutines, if you want to call them from a coroutine, you could still have that, and you could still run them asynchronously on the pl on the library. So both iOS and Android don't need to know how they actually run asynchronously. Does that make sense? But if you want to run, uh, in fact, the the API call uh, in the background, uh, how how can you do it? As so the same. Da -da -da. See where are we? So this that you see here, this is in the in the library side, and this is calling the API. This API dot Instagram photos that's launching the call from the Kator client. So by doing this global scope and then launching the coroutine, then is how you will tell him the, li the multi-platform library to run on a on a background thread. Uh, but uh, from the application dispatcher uh, implementation in iOS part, mm -hmm. I saw that it's the uh, the main uh, the main queue. So I guess it's still from the main thread. Uh, in terms of the actual implementation of what you see here, I will trust that you know more than I do in the iOS side. But that's how you would, you could still say that when I run it from the background thread. Other option that we had, for example, when building the library was let's make all the code synchronous on the library, and then we will deal with the asynchronous uh, on the platform level, on the Android app or the iOS app. So you could also do that. If you don't want to leverage the, the coroutines on the, on the pl multi-platform library level, you can still make them synchronous, and then you will have to deal with the asynchronous part on your side. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, thanks a lot for listening. And I'll be around, so if you have any questions, you want to see some other code to talk about the asynchronous part on iOS, happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you.